Ah, okay. Okay, can I have everybody's attention? As I learned in high school, uh, you actually have to start within five minutes of the hour to actually call it a legitimate session, so we're going to get started. I'm Craig Thompson. I'm the president and CEO here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and we're really proud to be your host today. So we've got, uh, I think, over 600 high school students and their teachers from all over the metropolitan area. Uh, I'm not going to try and do a list of the high schools. You guys have had a chance to mingle and meet each other during the pizza and some of the earlier session. But what we want to do today and do for the next hour and a half, and the teachers always get worried at this point, so we are going to get done precisely at 7.30. The clock is wrong, okay? It's five after six. So when it says 8.30, we will get done so that people can get to the buses and transportation to get everybody home. Fortunately, it's a cold but nice night. We didn't have to do it last night when it was torrential uh, rain. We really are proud to host this because we are really excited to see you guys. Biology is a still just stunningly cool system. We as organisms and how we get to live our lives and be healthy and how we get to carry out our daily activities to us is just a never ending source of wonderment because in fact, we are the oldest hospital in the country that takes care of cancer patients. And cancer is the scariest disease when Americans are asked to fill out what do you worry about for your friends and family. Cancer is the one thing that everybody worries that disrupts our health. So, so cancer is what we do here at any one time here in Memorial Sloan Kettering in the hospital next door. We're taking care of 145,000 fellow New Yorkers who have cancer. We expect two thirds of them today to be alive and well and not thinking about their cancer diagnosis anymore five years from now. That's really amazingly different because when I was in high school and sitting in this room learning about science, actually I sat in a room like this up in the Woods Hole Biologics Laboratories because my dad ran a Coast Guard cutter uh, at, the, at the same time and we got to hear science from marine biology. Today the best science that's going on in biology happens because we can study humans because we've sequenced the human genome and we can start to make sense of what disease is all about. Now the surprise is when we actually sequenced the human genome, which happened in 2003, right about the time you guys were being born, we actually didn't learn anything. It was an incredible disappointment. We got three billion pieces of information about what you inherit from mom and from dad. We're all different because we're outbred. We don't, we're not like inbred mice or anything else. It gives us this amazing diversity, but everyone in this room is hoping to live to be 90 years old. And various things break down in human beings. And fortunately, we as society have things called hospitals where we can come and try and understand what's broken and try and fix that. Over the last 15 years, the most transforming disease that's benefited from sequencing the human genome is our understanding of cancer. Now the disappointment about biology is we often find out what's wrong before we have ways to fix it. And so cancer we now know you don't inherit from mom and dad. There are a few rare syndromes people have talked about. The BRCA genes which give breast cancer predisposition and a few other cancers are a rare example but they account for only 3% of cancer. Cancer occurs as a disease only in multicellular organisms. That makes sense because what really cancer is, is one cell deciding not to participate in the organized thing you have as a body, but to start to proliferate out of control and take more of the body's resources than is needed for that tissue and that type. That occurs because as cells replicate, they create damage to the DNA you inherited from mom and dad and those mutations that arise as we call it somatically, 
in just an individual cell or a group of cells in your body as they are perpetuated to regulate the process of tissue regeneration. Now, we've been doing this course for 11 years. Everything I'm about to tell you, we didn't know 11 years ago. We used to think that every cell in your body could actually be transformed into cancer cell by mutations. That's not true. We used to think that every organism that was multicellular could get cancer because it constantly regenerated tissue. That's not true. So it's a fascinating part of biology that by studying this devastating human disease, we can learn fundamentally new things about biology and about how life works. So it turns out that just being large and long-lived and multicellular and having mutations in your DNA isn't enough to get cancer. And you can know that in one interesting way today. 50% of the boys in this room are going to have a risk of cancer in their lifetime. We used to say 30% of women would get cancer in their lifetime, but unfortunately, like in everything else, women are catching up. And so 40% of women today, born today, are going to have cancer in their lifetime. Yet there has never, ever been a plant that had cancer. And we do not fundamentally understand why that is. It has something fundamental to do, which you're going to hear a little bit more about in the rest of the talks today, that we try to fix ourselves every time we're broken. All animals try and regenerate whatever is broken. You've cut yourself, you'll heal your skin. Everybody's had a bad cut. How many people have had a broken bone? You fixed it. You go outside and look at the trees that line the avenue right here, and they have broken limbs. A plant never tries to fix a broken limb. That's why we have people come and trim trees, because otherwise it looks ugly, because the broken limb just stays there. They never try and fix. They die back, and they regrow something else new from scratch, but they never try and fix something broken. The process of regeneration is what's going wrong. The very fact that we hope to all have productive lives to be into our 90s or beyond. Last year, I got criticized for saying you only wanted to live to be 90. So it's OK. You can want to live to be 125 or whatever. But to be able to do that, you must constantly renew yourself. You must constantly regenerate tissue. All of the blood cells you came with here, the five gallons of blood that you have, five quarts of blood that you have, have to be made over every 100 days must constantly be regenerated. It's that process of regeneration that gives us the risk of cancer. It's the cells regenerating tissues of our body and replenishing it that causes our, we know that because of the sequencing of the genome that we and others take on the behalf of cancer patients. We're going to focus tonight, we've got three amazing speakers who are going to focus on why cancer is a problem of regeneration and start to think about that. And we're going to use that. We're going to hear about some model organism systems that go from fish to actually mice as model organisms for why all animals are susceptible to cancer and what we can do about it. And we're going to end by covering some of the concepts that have been in the newspaper and in all of your classes, I would suspect, by now, which is this amazing revolution that our body can cure us of cancer that our own immune system can fight back against cancer. So I can see a couple of the teachers smiling. So clearly, you've covered it in some of those kenyus. We did not have any appreciation of that 10 years ago, that that would be possible. And now we have these exciting new therapies you see every day that were just approved uh, by the FDA so that we can give them daily to patients of, um, of um, what's called immuno-oncology, immunotherapy. So our last speaker is going to cover that. We also have come to appreciate that we are made up of a large number of cells that have to cooperate to make a functional human being. Six times 10 to the 13th, if somebody, all of, some of you guys are writing notes, so that's an amazingly big number of cells that all have to have a coordinated activity. And the interesting problem is we're constantly having to understand how we work as an organization from the building blocks that make us up, which are the individual cells. 
Cancer cells have just a little bit of something wrong with them that makes them unable to obey the normal physiologic signals that control our tissues in our body. But they're like all the other cells in our body. They'll fight to tooth and nail to stay alive and maintain their progeny. And they use those properties to fight back against therapies and to actually take over parts of the body. The problem of cancer has really been illuminated in the last 25 years. For the first, Memorial's been here as a cancer hospital for 134 years. For the first 80 or so of our years of existence, if our surgeons couldn't take out the tumor in its earliest stages, or we couldn't give radiation therapy before the tumor had metastasized, we had no chance of curing patients. Today, with the molecular understandings that come from this field called precision medicine that comes from the sequencing of what's wrong in an individual cancer patient, and these amazing discoveries about what wound healing, wound repair, which is the field of regeneration is, and how the immune system can be regulated based on that, we wouldn't have this phenomenal opportunity to help people. So we're gonna try and cover those new concepts that are new really in the time since you've come to school. It didn't affect us at all for the first 10 and 20 years. That's what makes biology an amazing discipline. We don't want you to just learn about cancer biology though. We want you to understand biology in its largest form is a great discipline to engage in. It informs every part of our life from our own individual health to in fact being able to feed the world, to be able to keep the world healthy, and to understand things that are damaging the world. And all of that, we'd like to open up some of your eyes to. And so one thing I have to put a plug in is that it, after each presenter, we're gonna ask some of you guys to ask questions. Somebody's gotta be brave to do the first one. Uh, and to think about that so we get into a dialogue right from the get-go. Because the people that ask the best questions we've learned, are people newest thinking about a problem. And these guys are going to tell you about really three fascinating biology problems. The second plug i got to put in is that we have great high school summer programs. We hope some of you will be interested in applying for. Some of you may not want to do it in cancer. Our people that do navigation will help you learn about other high school programs if you're interested in what goes on in biology research. And that's what this is all about. So with that as a preamble, I have to teach you one thing today. Because that's my only task as the president and CEO. And we're about public health. So what are the things you can do to avoid cancer? I need, this is the first part of participation of the audience. What do you know you can do? I promised this to the president of SUNY the other night, which is a university system you might want to think about applying because it's great. Then I'd ask this question. Okay. Okay, so this is the problem with you guys being advanced biology students. So she, she's right, avoid po advanced polyphenols, but that's a little bit fancy. I was looking for things you could tell mom and dad, you learned there and are really true, okay? Not, 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 not what you tell your biology, but it's right, so that's great, yeah. Smoke, yeah, okay, so everybody's heard this, right? They've driven you to crazy since you were like fourth grade and you had your first health class, right? Wear sunscreen. Wear sunscreen, okay? So it's amazing. Americans, a world that loves to tan. New York still has tanning salons. The biggest epidemic is of skin cancers of the fatal variety. So you know those and you paid attention in class. Three years ago, the number one avoidable cancer changed. It was tobacco. Today in America, the number one thing you can do to maintain health and avoid cancer has changed. Anybody know what it is? So that's an old idea. There's virtually no evidence it's true. <laughs> but there's thousands of papers about it. What else? Somebody said it, so you just gotta shout it out again. You gotta be brave. So the number one cause of avoidable cancer today is obesity. We did not know that 10 years ago. That's something you can surprise your parents with. America's getting wider 
and it is dramatically increasing the rate at which we get cancer. So as we get better with sunscreens and not smoking, because very few of you compared to 25 years ago, even though I probably many of you have tried a cigarette, don't actually smoke. That's all a good thing for your health, but obesity has replaced all the other things. It's the number one avoidable cause. So if you're interested in that, we have programs studying that, both from a scientific and biological perspective, and why it is that we overeat, which is really fascinating. Why we don't understand our body's satiety and stop eating when we get too many calories. So with that as a preamble, today is gonna to be about regeneration in the immune system. Our first speaker, Dr. Philip Niedheimer is um, going to tell you what we do to learn about how our body recognizes it's been damaged to initiate both the fact that damage has occurred and we need to regenerate and understand that damage and repair it. And he does that using zebrafish. So, Philip, you're on. Thanks very much, Craig, for this nice introduction. And also, hello to all of you. I mean, it's actually a great feeling to stand in front of such a young and energetic audience. Um, so I would like to talk about, as uh, Craig already a little bit alluded to, about um, the uh, relationship between cancer and wounds. And my lab particular studies wound responses. So you might have come across the saying, cancer is a wound that does not heal. I, I take this as a punchline of my talk today, but I don't want you to take this really literally in a way cancers and wounds are the same thing. Medically, they're entirely different things. Um, when you have a pinhead size wound, unless you get a really bad infection, this won't be, this is annoying, but it's not really bad, right? If you have a pinhead size cancer, this can grow into something much more dangerous uh, that can at some point present a really uh, threat to life. So medically speaking, cancers and wounds are not the same, but if you look under the surface, and we scientists like to do that on the microscopic and the molecular level, there are astounding similarities um, between wounds and cancer that have been noticed and kept generations of scientists uh, fascinated and interested now for over a century. And, um, I would just like to start to point out here um, the similarity just by the, you know, just pointing out that some cancers and wounds really look very similar. So what you see here on the left hand side is, um, is, a, is a wound in the foot of a diabetic patient. These are actually quite nasty wounds that heal, heal very poorly. And what you see here on the right side um, is, a, is a skin cancer it's called squamous ca um, carcinoma in medical terms. This is a, the cancer that you would get if you don't use sunscreen and have um, prolonged um, UV illumination. So, um, but uh, what, what you can't really see with your bare eyes and what we scientists are interested in are really the molecular similarities between these two phenomena. And um, I just want to quickly point them out here. So in many ways, um, cancers and wounds behave very similar. So in a wound, um, you have an environment that stimulates um, uh, division of cells, multiplication of cells. And this entirely makes sense, of course, because if you have a wound, you lose tissue. You need to replace it. The way the tissue replaces cells is the cells that are healthy divide and then grow into the wound. So here, it makes entirely sense. In the case of a cancer, um, cells also multiply, but this actually causes the cancer to grow. Um, likewise, in the case of a wound, um, you have a, a strong stimulation of cell motility, so ce cells become really agile, move around, and this is again important because um, when you have a hole in your skin, you want to close it, and for that you need to pull the healthy tissue over the wound, and this is what the, the motile cells do. But in cancer, the cells also become motile, actually through very similar mechanisms. But here, um, this causes really something extremely insidious. Um, it causes the cancer to spread throughout the body, and um, this uh, is called medically, in medical terms, metastasis, and this is one of the most deadliest aspects of cancer. So um, uh, last but not least, um, you see both in cancer and in, in wounds, immune cell recruitment. And again, in, in wounds, this makes entire sense. If you have a hole in the skin, you have the risk of pathogens invading, and you have to um, find some way to kill them off that you don't get infected and sick. 
Um, also, um, some immune cells are very good in helping wounds to heal, so they secrete chemicals that allow the wound to heal faster. Now, if you imagine the same thing happens in a cancer too, because um, uh, our immune cells mistake the cancer cells for a wound. They get attracted by a very similar mechanism, and that is what much of my talk will be about, and um, help the cancer and, uh, um, uh, to grow and, and actually nurture it. So um, uh, besides these similarities, there's also another very important link between um, wounds and cancer, and that is if you have suffered chronic injury to some organ or uh, yeah, some chron chronic damage, um, even if you don't recognize that yourself, this is one of the strongest endogenous inducers of cancers that, that is known. So constant wounding over and over again at the same place increases your risk to get cancer in this particular place because you stimulate all these processes um, all the time. So um, if that is true, um, uh, that cancer sort of uh, 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 mimic wounds and, and in that way trick our, our, our body actually to help them. Um, uh, we, um, this is actually quite terrifying thought because we are up with cancer against one of the most powerful forces of nature that is evolution itself that made our wound responses as efficient as they are to help us but these responses then turn against us if we get cancer. So this is quite a terrifying notion, but um, there's uh, some glimmer of hope in that too, because if wounds actually um, uh, are so similar to cancer, we should be also uh, be able to learn something about the inner workings of cancers by looking at wounds, and that at some point will help us to probably treat this terrible disease better. So my lab focuses on the one particular aspect of the wound response. How do immune cells get recruited to the wound? So, um, and we do that by directly looking in a live animal and watching immune cells going to the wound. So ideally, we would like to do this in, in, in of course, in humans and in larger animals. And uh, we'll hear something probably um, about, about um, the mouse, which is a favorite um, lab animal um, in cancer research later in, 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 this, in this session. But um, one problem with these larger animals is if you want to directly look at microscopic processes, these things are just too large. They don't really fit under a microscope. And there's a second um, drawback. We, um, larger animals, are not transparent. To see anything inside of them, you have to put a window in them. Right? And this is possible, and people do that. It is technically just extremely challenging, and it is slow. So we, in my lab, we exploit the, the, the notion that wound responses are actually ancient. So at a time when, when there were not yet humans on Earth, there were still um, organisms swimming in ponds, fishes, that had almost the complete repertoire of mechanisms to, um, to heal wounds that we nowadays still um, uh, live from. So, and if that is true, um, that, that the mechanisms of wound response got developed here far back in evolution, we can also learn a lot about the wound response using these, these uh, more ancient, um, our more, uh, these more ancient animals. And they have some crucial advantages. So in my lab, we use, um, uh, use fish to investigate the wound response. And fish are small, and the babies of this particular fish that we are using, the zebra fish, they are entirely transparent, so you can look inside of them without actually implanting windows. So, um, and this is a huge, experimentally, it's a huge advantage. It makes the work also much faster. So zebra fish are tropical freshwater fish. Um, naturally, they occur in India. Um, the wound responses of the, the zebra fish are very conserved. They are, you can't, they, the main principles are entirely the same that you will see also in humans. So we can learn from them about humans. And the most crucial advantage of these fish is their babies, which you see here. And this is a drawing of mine about zebra fish babies are like three pinheads um, next to each other. They're really small. You can put a lot of them at the same time under the microscope. And what you see here, um, is um, the tail part of a zebra fish that we typically wound with a needle, little needle. And what you see probably here, um, it's a little bit dark, but you probably see it anyway. Um, here's the blood circuit of the zebra fish baby. And um, what you probably see is this little guys running towards this incision wound, which is here. 
and we'll later in a few slides learn what these little guys are. But when I saw this movie first time, I was entirely fascinated because um, um, how do these these guys know where the wound is. It seems like a, such a simple question, but it's actually not so simple. If I get lost in Manhattan, I take my smartphone and you know I, I take some Google Maps or GPS app, and then I you know find my way or not, which happens often enough. But um, these guys, they don't have smartphones, obviously. So how do they do it? How do they know where the wound is? So. Um, much in science, in biological science, it's about looking at these kind of pieces of data and doing a lot of experiments. But, you know, to get really into a field of, um, of a new territory, uncharted scientific territory, it, science is also about asking the right questions. And the questions I want to ask in the following, um, uh, in the remaining time, are, um, so first of all, who's called to the wound? What are these little guys that are going to the wound? Who's calling them? What are the SOS signals that call them to the wound? And what is that all good for? I want to go through these questions now one by one and, um, and, uh, and start just with a very obvious question. So what are these cells that are running towards the wound? So um, probably some of you could have guessed this because I talked about immune cells earlier. These cells that are going to the wound are immune cells. So they are a particular type of immune cell that is called neutrophil. Neutrophil are white blood cells, and um, they typically are in the vasculature. If you have a wound, they go out of the vasculature and go towards the wound. So they have two main functions. One function is to disinfect the wound. They can spit out a lot of chemicals that are toxic for bacteria, and thereby they kill them off and prevent infection. But they can also secrete chemicals that help to um, heal the wound. Um, so um, what you see here is in zebrafish, but the human neutrophil actually functions entirely the same. So what you see here is a blood smear and a human neutrophil through, um, in between red blood cells. And you can see this neutrophil. This is actually a very classic movie that's already quite old. Um, uh, hunting this um, this bacterium, it's almost so. You, so, how does the neutrophil know where the bacterium is? So, it, this is a very similar similar um, situation as um, um, as a hunting dog that takes you know that takes track of game essentially. The, there are ex the, the bacterium exhausts chemical substances that can be smelled by the neutrophil, and the neutrophil just follows it to the bacterium, tries to catch it and kill it. So um, the next question is really who is calling the, um, the neutrophils? So the generally, um, um, the field thinks that the most important attractor of these immune cells are cells that are about to die, or that are dying, in the process of dying. And you probably have cells already in biology classes. So cells are surrounded by a thin membrane called plasma membrane that keeps all their insides inside of them. So the idea is if you have an injury, this membrane breaks and lets out what's inside the cell outside, and this can be smelled by the neutrophils. And they go there, and that's also where the wound is. So that's the common thought, thought in the field. So what we found that this is not the whole story. Um, uh, um, so um, the uh, leakage of, of cytoplasm from cells is one signal that can attract neutrophils. But even before that happens, um, uh, cells can call neutrophils. These are cells that are not yet dying, actually. They're just totally stressed out because there's a wound. When cells are really stressed out or run out of energy, they typically do one thing. And it doesn't matter. They do that in a zebrafish, in a human. They would even do that on a plastic dish. They take in water, and the cell um, swells up through that. And um, in my lab, uh, we, we actually figured out that this is actually um, a mechanism by which um, 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 stressed out cells can, at the wound site, can call immune cells even without dying cells in the, in the neighborhood. So, um, so what you essentially, and this is also something which is conserved in humans um, um, probably. So what you see here, and this is a little bit, the contrast is a little bit bad, this is a damaged liver. A, human, a chronically inflamed liver. And um, the, the, what you can see here are a lot of normal liver cells, which are quite small. But then you also see these big guys here. And these are ballooned hepatocytes um, that are quite common view in chronically inflamed liver. By the way, chronic inflammation of the liver is also in use of cancer. So you have a high risk of cancer if you have this state all the time. 
So, and what you can see also probably are these blue objects around those cells, and these are neutrophils. So this indicates that the same process that we found in zebrafish could be actually also conserved in humans, and that's something we would like to follow up in the future. But now, what are the SOS signals? And I, um, these are two signals we inv investigated quite a bit in my lab, calcium and hydrogen peroxide. Calcium, you know, is like the major component of your bones. So, um, hydrogen peroxide, you probably also know because it's in your uh, um, bathroom closet and people often use it for disinfecting wounds actually, and also for dyeing hair. So um, we can visualize actually the release of these signals directly at the wound site. And that's by genetically turning the zebrafish into an indicator stripe for, for, uh, for calcium or hydrogen peroxide. So we introduce proteins that start to glow when they are exposed to calcium or hydrogen peroxide. Then we make a wound with a little laser pistol right here and then we can see how, this, how calcium is generated around the wound site and hydrogen peroxide is produced around the wound site. And these signals are absolutely crucial to call the first leukocytes to the wound. So what are these signals actually good for? That's an important, obvious question, right? So what happens when you don't have these SOS signals? We did an experiment where we infected a fish with bacteria. Here we injected bacteria into the ear of the fish, um, which is... Uh, which you can see here in the scheme. And um, we also injected blue fluorescent um, beads here. So this uh, region would correspond to this region here. And the fish, we hacked into the genome of the fish to make their neutrophils actually glowing red. So, and, and so the red guys here, these are the same neutrophils that you saw before. And, um, and um, um, going either to the ear or not. In the situation where we don't have SOS signals, they don't find their infection actually. So, and these uh, animals will have a higher likelihood of dying later from the infection. So it seems that SOS signals are a very nice invention of nature to protect us against inv uh, infection very efficiently. Um, unfortunately, cancer uses these signals to actually trick our own bodies in, um, in, 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 in you know, our own body cells in helping the cancer to grow. What you see here, this is an experiment uh, from a lab of a colleague of mine, and we have to see when the movie starts again. Look at this cell here. I hope it will start again. Um, uh, I can try to trigger it. Um, so it probably, um, for some reason, doesn't start it. And got kind of a hiccup. But uh, here it goes. Now you see this little cloud coming out of the cell? So this is hydrogen peroxide visualized by a dye that gets fluorescent when it sees hydrogen peroxide. And this cell here is a cell that expresses an oncogene. This is a gene that induces actually cancer in the cell. So these are precancerous cells. After this cloud appeared, you will see these red leukocytes hanging around, preferentially at the, around this cell that expelled this, this, this burst of hydrogen peroxide. And as I saw, told you before, hydrogen peroxide is one of the most important wound signals that we found in the wound case. Exactly the signal that is released at the wound here. So, and it's uh, also in the ca this cancer case, it calls leukocytes in. And the problem of that is that um, if this occurs, um, these cells um, divide quite rapidly. So these um, leukocytes secrete substances that stimulate the cancer cells or the precancer cells to divide and, and, and thereby um, encourage the formation of a tumor. And um, wounds do just the same. If you have an animal that has a lot of these precancerous cells and wound it all the time at the same place, and people did that here at the tail fin, um, in the animal that is wounded, you get eventually, after 18 months, a long time, so you have to wound it really a long time repeatedly, you get a tumor. Whereas in the unwounded animal, you don't see this. So I would just like to uh, wrap up now. Um, the bottom line is that cancers disguised at wounds and our bodies try to heal both. Certain white blood cells, neutrophils, um, promote infection defense, wound healing, and cancer, and cancers lure white blood cells by wound signals. Zebrafish are a very nice model to study that because they are small and you can look inside of them. And inhibiting wound signals could help to improve cancer therapy. Thank you for your attention. So at the root of what Dr. Needheimer told you is that in fact, it's our ability to try and fix wounds. This is different than plants that leaves all animals susceptible to the disease of cancer. And by studying a simple thing like a tropical fish, 
he can learn fundamental things about that process. And just to make you understand it's important to the tropical fish, the number two reason the tropical fish die in the wild out on a coral reef, the first is predation by the shark. But the second is actually melanoma, skin cancer, because they get the UV light to the side. They're in the sun on all the time. And so this is a real biology even for the fish, and it starts with these regeneration mechanisms that Philip talked about. Questions for him. Somebody's got to be brave to start this. Yeah. So, Phil, can you repeat it? And I'm going to ask everybody else from now on, because you were the brave one, so you didn't have to, go up to the microphone, because we have two full rooms of people that couldn't get in here that are listening and need to hear you on the microphone. So anybody else after that? But, Philip, repeat the question. How did you know to look for calcium yeah, so, and hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, how to look for calcium and hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide, that was serendipity. Sometimes it happens in science that you have a hunch. For us, it was really the idea that um, um, we were interested in the biology of these, uh, what is called reactive oxygen species. We wanted to know actually what kind of physiological role they played. And I, I, I would like to tell a more you know, intellectual story here that we knew and uh, you know, knew it before, but actually we just made wounds in fish and looked at hydrogen peroxide and ta-da, it was there. And then we inhibited that and then the leukocytes were not coming anymore. And there was the field, right, that, I was that I'm still studying. So it's serendipity. Other questions? Yeah, we got to get up to a microphone. Come on. And for the next talk, you have to come to the microphone. I won't call on you unless you come to the microphone. Um, what triggers the uh, cells to release the calcium and hydrogen peroxide? It's a very good question. So calcium is, um, is uh, there's very little calcium inside cells in the cytoplasm. Um, and there's a lot of calcium outside cells in the extracellular space or in the interstitial fluid. So the fluid that is between the cells and the tissue. So um, the, the actual source of calcium in this response that you saw is not quite, quite clear yet, but I could give you some ideas. So one idea is that when the cells really swell up around the wound site and get really stressed out. There are channels that are opening in this plasma membrane, so in the skin that surrounds the cells, and those let calcium in. Now, how is hydrogen peroxide produced? We know which enzyme, so which protein, which molecule produces it, and as it happens, this protein needs calcium to produce hydrogen peroxide. It is, um, it is a protein that takes an electron from a chemical inside the cell um, and transfers this through the membrane of the cell onto oxygen. And that oxygen then reacts further to make this hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, essentially. So, um, so calcium is required for the hydrogen peroxide. So when we understood that its hydrogen peroxide is so important, we of course asked, and we knew this protein would need calcium to be functional, we asked, is there also a calcium signal? And of course, we found this. So. All right, since nobody else has gotten up, I'm going to ask Philip, thank you very much for a very stimulating start. <laughs> and what he told you is that chemistry matters too, if you just listened to what he told you about how the hydrogen peroxide. So for those of you that like chemistry almost as much as biology, there's a place for you uh, at this too. So the next speaker is actually going to talk about how it is that we get cells that we don't want to die, and how we keep alive cells we want to keep, and how sometimes tumors usurp that process to kill off the immune cells that are going to cause them harm and actually allow themselves to grow. So Micro Overholzer actually described one of the fundamental forms of cell death that informs this process. He discovered the process of cannibalism in our bodies. Uh, he has a different name for it, but I want to give it out for what it is. Cancer cells can learn to eat their neighbors to keep, to keep them from causing harm to themselves. And he'll tell you a little bit about that. Okay. I go. Craig, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. It's nice to meet all you guys. It's great to see you here. Craig uh, mentioned it in the beginning, but um, 
if you choose it, many of you are the future of biomedical research, right? Cause, so to see all of your young shining faces out here to learn about science is absolutely fantastic. So welcome. Gotcha. So uh, yeah. Craig introduced it Question. earlier on, but unfortunately cancer is still a very deadly, very pervasive disease. Most of you in the audience, maybe all of you, have a personal story that already connects you and your family um, to cancer. And what's different in the last 10 years, maybe even 20, is that some of those stories now have more hopeful outcomes than they used to, right? If you look at the actual death rates from cancer, they're far reduced from what they could have been by much earlier projections. This is due in part to better detection and also modern therapies, right? Um, but still, with 140,000 new cases and 50,000 deaths projected every month in 2017, the question remains ever-present. Uh, if cancer is killing us, right, how do we learn how to kill the cancer? And you're going to hear after me from Dr. Schiedinger um, a new idea that actually Dr. Thompson set up in the introduction, immunotherapy, right? This is representative of the dawn of a host of new ideas of how to cause cell death in a specific way to treat cancer. And you're going to hear more about this in the next talk. And in immunotherapy, researchers and clinicians are learning how to train your own immune system to recognize, target, and ultimately destroy cancer cells. This is going to involve specialized cells called T cells in your immune system. They actually physically bind individual cancer cells in the body and can kill them one at a time to remove them from uh, the diseased tissue. So this is an example of the emergence of new therapies that are really showing the power of learning how to induce cell death in a specific manner. That leads me to the question for my talk. How is it that cells die anyway, right? And we've really had a revolution in the cell death field in the last five, ten years as well because we've learned there's a lot of different ways that cells can die. And they're highly regulated cell fate decisions. It turns out cells actually die accidentally far in a far more rare uh, circumstance than we used to think. Most deaths we're finding now are highly regulated. And I'm going to draw a cell like this to keep it simple. Uh, as Philip pointed out, this would have a plasma membrane covering it to keep the intracellular content separate from the extracellular environment. You guys should all know what else is inside of this cell by now from biology class, right? I won't ask you like, stuff like this. Okay, nuclei, trafficking, secretory machinery, powerhouse of the cell, right, mitochondria, <laughs> uh, lysosomes, these are major degradative organelles we're going to talk about more. Okay, but to keep it simple, I'll keep most of the details out and maybe keep a nucleus here for now. The, but there are different ways cells can die. The way we understand the best, because it's been studied the longest, is called apoptosis. Some of you may have heard of this before. You may have heard of it as uh, programmed cell suicide. The word apoptosis was coin, coined 45 years ago. Okay, so this has been studied for many decades, and therefore we know a lot about it. When a cell commits to apoptose, uh, due to a series of signaling events that are highly regulated, this, the entire cell, the plasma membrane and the nucleus, will undergo extensive fragmentation. They'll essentially blow into pieces, and that's lethal for that cell. And we know a lot about this, okay? It's required for normal development. It's how you developed properly. It's how you have, for example, fingers and toes, right? It, uh, apoptosis performs important sculpting functions in development, and uh, there's interdigital cell death through apoptosis shown here in a mouse model that actually clears cells out from in between what then, what then form fingers and toes for you. Similarly, your in a lot of your internal organ structures are sculpted by this kind of cell death, okay? This is a drawing of some of the inner workings <laughs> of the mammary gland. The mammary gland, like other glandular structures, has tubes and ducts that have hollow lumens. Eventually in the mammary gland, these are going to need to carry milk to exit the body to feed a baby, right? But the way these tubes are formed is through apoptosis, shown here again in a mouse model. Individual cells undergo cell suicide in order to sculpt and tunnel out hollow spaces that will eventually carry milk in the adult, okay? We also know that apoptosis is going on inside of each one of your bodies right now, all right? Tens of millions of, ce of cells inside of you die this way each day as part of the normal turnover process within different tissues. And even the first example I showed you for immunotherapy, if a T cell can find and engage a cancer cell in a patient and eliminate it, what the T cell is doing is binding to that cell and convincing it to undergo apoptosis. Okay, so the first form of cell death, just to get into the intro here, 
um, that we know the most about, you may have heard it before, it's called apoptosis, it's cell suicide, and we know this is tumor suppressive. Many kinds of cancer, we know, turn apoptosis off, okay, by genetic mutations, and even back to the mammary gland. This would be an example of a duct or a tubule in the mammary gland that, like I said, would carry milk. When the breast cancer first forms, the cells grow back into the space that was cleared by apoptosis and repopulated because they've turned off apoptosis. They're not going to be cleared anymore. In later, more aggressive tumors, the cells will learn to invade this way into the surrounding tissue and they can move around through the body. Okay? So apoptosis is clearly tumor suppressive. Cancers turn it off in order to form. There's a concerted effort. Immunotherapy is one of these to turn it back on to try to eliminate cancer from patients. But I've called apoptosis number one because it's now just the tip of the iceberg of a huge landscape of different kinds of cell death that, like apoptosis, are regulated cell fate decisions. I'm going to tell you about two more and then show you more of the landscape as a summary slide. So the second form, Craig stole my thunder here, we call entosis, right? This is actually cannibalistic. And so unlike apoptosis, this is not a cell suicide at all, which really surprised us when we found it. And I have to draw two cells. This is cell one. Cell two will make green. And in, by this program, it, 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 it is a cannibalistic form of cell death. So cell one is going to wind up completely swallowed inside of cell two. But during that process, it's viable and alive. And then later, cell two can decide to kill or murder cell one if it wants to. Okay, so here, I'll show you the movie. Cell one's being completely enwrapped by cell two, and yet it's alive the whole time. So huge shape deformations. And I'll put the nuclei back on for you for the cell biologists here. Uh, what would happen then is the lysosomes. I introduced these very quickly as degradative organelles, right? They have lytic enzymes that can degrade all the macromolecules in the cell for recycling purposes. In this case, lysosomes would fuse around cell one, and those enzymes would kill cell one in a murderous event and they degrade it all the way down. And the nutrients harvested back will be utilized by the green cell. So we call this cell the loser cell because it dies and gets killed. We call the green cell the winner cell, okay? And this is, unlike apoptosis, a cell murder. I want to show you the first movie we ever took of entosis. This is now, apoptosis was found 45 years ago. This is 10 years ago, so much, much more recent history. It's the first movie we ever made. This cell would be the blue one. It's going to bind to this one, would be the green, and become wrapped in three-dimensional space completely inside. There it goes. And wait for it. Now you can start to see the relationship between the two emerging. This is a completely viable cell that's encased in three-dimensional space inside of the other one, and it will be murdered. If you block lysosome function, that cell inside can actually escape and come back. Okay, it's part of the curiosity of the regulation. Now this program, unlike apoptosis, <laughs> is inherently competitive. What do I mean by that? Well, look, if some of you here, if all of you decide to engage in entosis, right, some of you are losers and some are winners. And so unfortunately, those of you losers would not be here after the end of the session, right? <laughs> but the winners, the winners that were the ones on the outside would be totally fine. This is competitive. Some of you are going to win, some of you are going to lose. And if you imagine here, blue cells are losers and green are winners, right? If you were a cell, a winner cell, once you kill that blue cell, the macromolecules you digest are nutrients that you would use to grow bigger. And then by cells logic, you would then divide. Okay, so watch the animation. The winners here are have just ingested the losers. I'm sorry. Lysosomes are going to fuse around the losers, kill them, digest it away, and the green cells grew bigger, then they divided. Right? So this is now winner cell selection. There's the same number of cells now as when I started, but they're all green, right? The blue cells are gone. Okay? And their space is taken over by the winners that use the nutrients to grow and then to support proliferation. So we see evidence for this process, crazy as it sounds, happening in cancer. This is the section of a human breast cancer. Um, and this would be one of these ductal structures that's usually hollow, right? But this is an earlier stage cancer. The cells are growing in this way towards the center of what was a hollow structure. And they're leaving the stroma out here, which is where actually blood vessels are that provide nutrients, okay? But these vacuolated structures are all evidence of entosis going on in this patient's cancer. If you look by a different kind of imaging, you can actually highlight the cell membrane, for example, of this cell in red, and a nucleus that looks perfectly normal. It's a viable cell. This is completely enwrapped inside of the membrane of the neighboring cell that has its own nucleus. Okay, so we know by imaging studies, this actually goes on in human cancer samples. And when the cells that are ingested are dying, we see the same hallmarks of this, of this 
lysosome-mediated murderous program. So the same thing I just showed you in culture is going on in human cancers. Now, those of you who have really good eyesight and, and are thinking carefully may notice something else. It's a little hard to tell, but some of you may notice. A lot of these vacuolated entotic structures, that's kind of closer here to the middle than the edge, right? And the edge, remember, this would be a hollow duct that carries milk. The blood supply that brings nutrients to the cells from what you eat or from the air you breathe are out here. There's one here. There's probably one there. So this, as cancer cells grow in, they get farther and farther away from their nutrient sources. So this gave us an idea, right? Maybe if these structures are farther away from nutrient sources than normal, it's starvation that makes cells do this, okay? And back to my analogy for the room, if some of you didn't eat pizza earlier, as this goes on longer and longer, then your neighbor's gonna look more attractive to you as a nutrient source, right? <laughs> and so that, that was the hypothesis, that as cancer populations grow uncontrolled, they, they often grow in the, it, to regions where nutrients are not so plentiful from your blood supply, and they need to re recruit new vessels in ultimately, but they also experience periods of nutrient starvation, and maybe when glucose, amino acids, oxygen, key nutrients that cells need become limited by distance, and ptosis could be triggered, and you, who didn't eat pizza, could feed yourself by eating your neighboring cell. Or so that's the hypothesis. Maybe nutrient <laughs> starvation could be a key inducer of cell competition through entosis in cancer cell populations. And indeed, that's what we just found. So this was recently published. If you take away glucose in particular, a key nutrient that you get by nutrition that your cells need, if you put cancer cells in the absence of glucose for a long time, meaning two, two days, three days a week, they start doing this. They start eating each other. These are cannibalized cells that I'll, I'll color code for you. This winner here has seven previous neighbors that it has now ingested, okay? Which is a huge nutrient bolus <laughs> that could support the proliferation of that particular cell and its lineage, okay? So uh, to carry the analogy a little further, some of you could be in a row with one of these super winners and then the six people nearby, or seven, or maybe in some trouble. Okay, and we know this from a lot of experiments that I'm not gonna take the time to show you, but here's one key experiment. This winter cell with a black arrow has three losers inside, and in the absence of glucose, it goes on and divides and makes two siblings, okay? So, one layer deeper, I wanna tell you for those following this, one thing about the signaling, because it's really bizarre and wonderfully beautiful. What we found, the signal to make this go is a low energy signal through a key kinase that senses that called AMPK. What I'm saying is, the hungriest of you here, if by analogy it's held true, would actually give yourselves up to those who aren't as hungry. It doesn't make any sense, right? You'd think you'd save yourself, or the other way around. And so, it, it, in essence, those with the lowest amount of energy in the cell population are giving themselves up for cells that already have more to make them even stronger. We find that very strange, okay? We think it's actually quite interesting. This same signal can control a process within cells that I'm not gonna talk about called autophagy, that signal can help cells restore their own energy to some extent, but it makes them shrink a little bit. So you have this dichotomy here. The two fundamentally different decisions funneled through the same kinase to either give yourself up if you're an individual cell or to try to rescue yourself if you're an individual cell. And we think the key is time, okay? That within our cell population here of us individuals, in the short term, you might get food again. So you'll do a program that is a little bit damaging to you, but you can gain energy back called autophagy. But in the long term, as a population, we may decide if we talked about it, right? There's no food coming. We need to save our population. And then the weaker ones may give themselves up for the stronger because they're the best ones that have a chance to carry the population forward. And this is a logic I'm stealing from a whole field called cell competition, okay? What I don't have time to show you the details on is all the tissues in your body were selected during your development as an embryo in exactly the same logical framework for fitness of the tissue, not for the individual cell rescuing ability of certain pathways, okay? So this is a 30 or 40 year old field that carried from fruit flies all the way up now to mammalian studies shown here. In the embryo, the individual cells in the tissue can also sense relative fitness. And what happens is loser cells, right, are sacrificed for the betterment of the tissue and for your health as an organism rather than saving individual cells that may be in trouble, they're eliminated. Exactly the same logic in development, and here's an image of a developmental competitive process we think resembles entosis. 
that there's this dichotomy and a key decision made. When do you save an individual cell and when do you make a tissue better? And cancer, as we think, a key input to that decision is nutrient starvation. Okay, so the first form of cell death I had shown you was apoptosis. The second one I just showed you is entosis. We think in, on balance in the long term, this could be a tumor promoting process, right? It's still uh, the subject of questions and experiments and hypotheses, but you might imagine this can make tumors in some context stronger and you might want to turn this off and not let them do it. For those of you who've read this book, uh, I, Pretty sure this was in my middle school curriculum, or it could have been high school. I don't know if it's in yours, but if you've read it, and if you didn't follow all the details of what I said, think of it this way. It's a little bit sort of like a cellular version of Lord of the Flies. Those of you who have read that will understand. Okay, I'm going to talk about one more kind, and I'll finish up here in a couple minutes. This one's called ferroptosis, and it's different from the other two. How cool. Ferroptosis. What happens is holes form in the very plasma membrane that keeps the blue color here separated from the external environment. Okay, so you get holes in the plasma membrane, and that lets all the ions and small molecules leak out, and that causes water to rush in, <coughs> and the whole cell eventually ruptures, and all the intracellular contents leak out. Okay? Now, I'm also going to call this cell one, because this has an effect in populations too, but it's different. Here, the death of this cell by ferroptosis, we found just last year, actually, can affect a neighboring untreated cell and make it undergo ferroptosis. Okay, so now, this is very different. What this suggests is, again, in the room, if someone at the edge of your row died by ferroptosis, that would spread all the way down your row. Okay, very different from competition. And in fact, here, if we could convince this blue cell to ferroptose, that by a domino effect could lead to the subsequent death of these green ones and so on. Maybe you could wipe out whole populations this way. Okay, and so the animation is here. This would be a propagating effect that we call a bystander effect. Innocent cells that are just nearby would get caught up in a wave of cell death by this uh, hypothesis. I want to show you what cells look like when they die. We just published this last year. This is a cell population that will undergo ferroptosis. When the cells die, they will turn green. And you can see, indeed, when they die, death sweeps through an entire population, except for one particular cell that didn't seem to care, as a wave. This is very unusual. We've never seen this before in the cell death community. I'll show it again. Once ferroptosis occurs in this culture, these are cells cultured in the dish. You'll just see it. It's going to sweep out as a wave-like pattern. Okay? Now, you can imagine a better experiment. You may be not satisfied with this one, right? Where we go, where we, uh, go back here. And well, let me see if I miss, miss my... Yeah, I think we're okay. You can imagine a better experiment now we separate these populations, right? Let's separate the green from the blue and just kill one color and see if it spreads to the other, right? So here's the animation. And we're just going to kill the green ones and put different cancer cells to the blue ones in a dish and see if ferroptosis here could spread to the ones we didn't even treat. And the movie's here. So we're going to make this population ferroptose, this clustering population. The other cells are, are uh, fluorescent red. They express a red fluorescent protein. What you'll see is when these cells ferroptose, what happens? Right? I mean, how cool. <laughs> so ferroptosis of these clustered cells actually spread through the ones that we didn't even treat. I'll, sh I'll show you how we do this in a second. Show you again. And all the thousands of cells in this field of view and across the whole dish are completely dead. They're gone. Now, we're doing this in a way that we can also try in animal studies because we're injecting a ferroptosis inducing agent. And in this experiment, we inject an agent that induces ferroptosis, I'll show you in a second, into the bloodstream. And the treated tumors here all have an inability to grow compared to the control in an experimental tumor. In fact, mo all of them partially regress. So we get a nice response experimentally. And what we're using here is a nanoparticle. Many of you may be aware of nanotechnology. Right? Making really, really small things, nanoscale. These are so small, you could fit several of them across inside of an individual lysosome. Okay? These are special nanoparticles that are already in the clinic here at Sloan Kettering for imaging studies of cancer. And they've been developed over 10 years by a chemist from Cornell University, Uli Wiesner, and a clinician scientist here at Sloan Kettering, Michelle Bradbury. In patients in the clinic, these are being injected into the bloodstream, and they're used as imaging agents because they stick in the cancer sites more than elsewhere. And you can tell where cancer is, which can guide surgical resection, right? What we found, and this is what we just published, is those same particles, if you 
updose them a little bit and more often you can use them as an anti-cancer agent in a mouse model. And so this involves a very key collaboration between cell biologists, like me, and a physician scientist here, Dr. Bradbury. And we found something really unexpected that we don't really understand that we hope has uh, clinical potential. Okay, so to finish up, the third form I showed you is ferroptosis. We think this is tumor suppressive like apoptosis. And these dots could go on for a separate seminar because this is the landscape of terminology that we now have, okay? And what I want you to notice as students is something very important. Most of the new names here are since 2000, right? Apoptosis 1972, okay, 45 years. These are very new. In biological research terms, this is extremely new. We don't understand this well yet at all, okay? And I showed you different examples from different categories of types of cell death we don't have time to talk about. But this is the landscape, and this is why we need you. I'm old. I don't want to be old, but I'm old, right? And you guys are the future of biomedical research. We need you to come in and get trained and then explain to us what a lot of this means, okay? So finally, let me just thank a couple people really quick. Monica here is doing a postdoc now as a grad student, did all the ferroptosis work, and is being followed up by Michelle Riegman to understand how death spreads. Uh, a couple of the key grad students here, Matei and Shafali, figured out how uh, cannibalism can reset nutrient homeostasis, and Jens Hamann, a grad student, uh, did all the glucose studies I showed you for entosis. And one more really key thing, my family's here, so they've... Uh, they've never seen me speak before, so Anne and Timothy, Matthew, Nicholas, uh, thank you. You mean everything. All right, so if you have questions, get to the microphones. The boys want you to ask questions because they're going to get quizzed later about their dad at home. Yes, right uh, there. Why doesn't ferroptosis kill the entire organism? Why doesn't ferroptosis kill the whole organism? Yeah, yeah like why so doesn't it spread to all the cells? It's a great question. So uh, there's, there's a piece to this that I didn't have time to talk about, that when we give these particles, the death really is also affected by the nutrient status of the cell. And so in culture, the way we get death to go most efficiently is if we also amino acid starve cells. So we're taking away a key nutrient again, right? And so it could be that cancer tissues are the most sort of nutrient compromised in that animal, and therefore they are the most sensitive. On top of that, though, the particles we are using are really designed to target these particular cancers. And that's been a 10-year effort, as I said, by a chemist and a clinician scientist here. So they're also really only sticking in the tumor site. So you have two reasons why the cancer could be more susceptible than normal tissues. But it's a, we're, we're still working this out. Those are our two best ideas. Great question. Right here. Um, you said that nutrient starvation triggers entosis. So is there anything that specifically triggers apoptosis, the first method? Yes. All right. so, OK. So, uh, Yes and no. There's a whole slew of things that specifically tr trigger apoptosis. You can see that as specific or not, right? There are many, many different signals uh, and many different cell stresses that cells can be under, including nutrient starvation, actually, that will also trigger apoptosis through a complex series of different signaling cascades. Um, so DNA damage, uh, immune cell signaling, nutrient starvation, um, context, where cells are, if they're matrix attached or not, you name it. You could we could probably come up with 30 things, Craig, maybe 100, that can cause apoptosis. So it's an enormous literature. Thank you. Over here. Um, what, would, sorry. what would cause the first uh, tumor cell to induce ferroptosis? Yeah. Well, that's a phenomenal question. Would you like to work it out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, we. Uh, what I didn't say in that little We Need You cartoon, we actually have no idea how it spreads, okay? We have, a, and we're, it's an active pro project. We just learned this a year ago, and so we have a graduate student in the lab working this out. We know how it doesn't spread. We've eliminated <laughs> some things. We don't know how it does, and we also don't therefore know what kicks off the first cell. We would propose cells are in slightly different states of nutrient being nutrient either fed or compromised, and that would be a predictor of this, but we have no evidence for it. So it, we, we don't know, actually. Somebody is more vulnerable for some reason. Yeah. OK, so that's the first star for the day. <laughs> really cool biology leads to somebody, if you get excited, saying, we don't know. And that's what makes biology exciting. There's so much we still don't understand. We know less than half of what we need to know about modern biology to really help people in health. 
and that's what makes it fun. So you, you get the award for first person <laughs> to stump one of the speakers. Next. Um. <laughs> and that's a good thing. So um, based off of all the ways that um, cell dies, which one has the most effectiveness for the decreasing of cancerous cells? That's also a, a difficult question to answer because we don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are on a roll. But it depends on, it, it probably depends on the means, okay? You're going to hear in the next talk about immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. That is probably fundamentally engaging apoptosis. And so if you went after a cancer that way, which is proving to be rather effective, uh, Apoptosis may be the most important, right? You, you might make a prediction that what's hard in a lot of therapies is to get your therapy to every cell. It's very hard, right? And Craig alluded to that not every cell is as cancerous as other cells, and now we know this. And so what therapeptosis might be special at is spreading from the cells you did get your therapy to to all the other ones you couldn't reach in the same diseased tissue. That's a great idea. We're trying to figure out if that's actually true. All right, thank you so much. Next. So, uh, I know that you mentioned something about nanotechnology, which I found really fascinating, but I was wondering whether you, uh, you, is it possible to kind of use genetic engineering, since that's kind of like growing as a field recently, is it possible to use that to create immunotherapy as like some sort of innate characteristic in humans? Um, Whereas, like, here you're kind of making immunotherapy like kind of uh, an intuitive learning thing for, like, humans, or you could, like, uh, use injections in some sort. I know there's, like, a lot of, uh, I suppose, ethical implications behind this, but is it possible as, like, a thing? Okay, so there's a lot wrapped up in your question, okay? <laughs> First of all, I'm going to bounce the immunotherapy parts to Dr. Schiedinger, who's going to talk about it more than, than I did, okay? But the answer is yes, you just need to get training and make it possible. Mm -hmm. Want to take the final question, and then we'll get on to the final speaker. Um, hi. Uh, so it, you said that um, nutrient starvation, could it, it's going to trigger um, entosis, but can't, if you starve the tumor cells um, of nutrients, can't it also find a way to the bloodstream and therefore, like, have a reverse effect and grow? And if that's possible, is there any way that you can control like how the tumor reacts? Like does it like induce entosis or like will the nutrient starvation induce entosis or will it like cause the tumor to go to the bloodstream? Oh, these are all great questions. There's a lot wrapped up in this too, yeah, okay? But that, no, I'll just, let me give you two really quick answers because I don't want to, I don't want to go too far into the next talk. Uh, that behavior, the cell biologically I showed you, could be involved in other processes like spreading in the bloodstream. And we don't know if that's true, but you could mm -hmm. imagine a scenario where it is. Mm -hmm. The second thing to say is uh, nutrient starvation is probably the tip of the iceberg for entosis. A lot of cell stresses that induce other forms of cell death also induce this one, right. we, which we haven't published. And they happen in mixtures. And so this is a very complicated question, right? Um, which I, I could talk to you about it more after if you want. But okay. Awesome. Thank you. One final question. Uh, I'm only going to give you guys one. Um, apoptosis, entosis, and paroptosis, does it happen? Relatively, or do they happen separately? So, uh, best guess, do uh, you mean are they happening together in a population or separately? Uh -huh. Best guess is at some frequency they can happen together, but there are particular <laughs> triggers we think can really trigger one versus another. But it again depends how you treat your cells. You can get mixtures or you can get more pure populations. But this is a really active area of research. Again, why we need you young people to come in and help us out. Okay, so I gotta unfortunately cut this off. Thank you. You guys are on a roll now. All three of the speakers will be around afterwards for individual questions and will all be available by email over the next few days if you have burning questions. The final speaker is Andrea Schiedinger, who is uh, one of the leading immunologists here at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And she is part of a team that has discovered the two forms of immunotherapy that are now curing patients in the clinic. One is called checkpoint blockade, and the other is a form of genetic engineering that was just talked about called CAR T cells. She's gonna give us an overview of what's happening and how we've learned new things about the immune system and harness that to fight cancer. Andrea. Thank you, Craig. You guys are really on a roll, so are you ready for round number three? learning almost everything about the immune system and cancer. So 
as you know, every single day, um, you are exposed to viruses, bacteria, pathogen. And somehow, our immune system is capable of protecting our body, right? So even though we are surrounded by uh, pathogens, somehow the immune system knows how to fight these viruses and these bacteria. And you don't get an infection, generally. So now, how does the immune system do that? And what are the cells that are responsible? And the question is, well, how is the immune system able to eliminate viruses and bacteria, but not so well to eliminate cancer cells? So now, the immune system consists of many, many cells. Do you guys know some of those? Shout out. White blood cells, exactly, which are called lymphocytes, OK? And there are two types of lymphocytes, white blood cells, OK? And the first one I'm going to talk about is the B cell. So these are lymphocytes. They have on their surface um, little structures, proteins. And they can also secrete those, what you may know as antibodies. So now when you have a virus or a bacteria in your body, you have millions or billions different B cells that are specific and can actually recognize that virus or the bacteria, the structure on the surface, and eventually eliminate it, OK? So that is important because, as you remember, when you were born, your parents maybe took you to the, or hopefully took you to the doctor, and you got vaccinated, immunized. And that's exactly what is happening. You get um, immunized with a virus and a bacteria. The B cells recognize it. They proliferate. They make antibodies. And that's what protects you throughout life against a reinfection with that virus or the bacteria. So the other cell I'm going to talk today more about are the T cells. These are smart little white cells, OK? And when a virus or a bacteria invades our body, cells pick it up, they break down the virus, and they present little parts of these proteins that are virus-specific, bacteria-specific, on the surface. And um, these little, these little um, parts, what get presented on the surface of a cell, we immunologists call antigens. So now, in the body, you have millions, billions of different T cells and specific T cells, and they have a receptor on their surface that is specific for that antigen. So now, when a T cell patrols through the body, sees that there is an antigen presenting cell, presenting antigen on the surface, that T cell knows, listen, I have to engage with that cell, and I eventually then um, have to kill the cell, as um, Mike beautifully um, described how it's working. So now, this is very, very powerful. So now, how is it? that our T cells or our immune system cannot do the same for cancer. Because as you know, patients or pa people develop cancers, and that cancer silently grows over years sometimes in the body, becomes bigger and bigger, and you don't feel it, you don't see it, and you suddenly have a symptom, you go to the doctor, and yes, there is something growing which shouldn't be growing in your body, and the immune system just doesn't realize it. So now when we zoom in on a cellular level, how this is working, is you have to think, how do cancers develop? A cancer develops from a normal cell, OK? Everything looks, looks great on the healthy patient. And then once in a while, there's a normal cell that transforms and it becomes a cancer cell. And that cancer cell proliferates and proliferates, becomes bigger, and forms the large solid tumor. So now, tumor immunologists thought, OK, maybe the reason why we cannot see or why the immune system cannot really see a cancer cell is because a cancer cell maybe looks too similar to normal cells and maybe not enough foreign like a virus or a bacteria. So the question now is, can we train our immune system to make the immune system see the cancer cell and eliminate it? And that idea to train the immune system actually um, gets back over 100 years. Um, uh, here in New York, at Memorial Hospital, we go to 1890s, where a very smart, um, highly sought after young surgeon called William Coley, um, one day in the 1890s, um, had a patient coming to his office, and that is the, the young lady on the left, Elizabeth Dachiel. And she came to him with, his, with her friend um, Rockefeller Jr. She had she had, a, she had a pain in her left arm, and Coley realized that this is not an infection, that's actually a sarcoma. And so he took her on, he um, operated her, but it was already too late. The cancer has spread, 
and Betsy eventually died of the cancer just a few months later. So Betsy's death really profoundly um, somehow shook Coley, and he wanted to do more. He wanted to think, he wanted to research and understand how can we do that, that we prevent um, cell deaths like um, Betsy. And so he was able to think out of the box, and he researched, and what he found out that when he had patients and he did um, surgery on them, when those patients had, in addition to their cancer or to, to the open wound and infection, those patients actually did better, and they survived more or longer from their cancer, and the cancer didn't really occur, recur. So he thought maybe we can use the immune system, right? Somehow it's the immune system must be involved to basically overcome or train and attack the cancer. And what we now know, or what we know as Coley's toxin, that's exactly what he went on in experimenting in the lab and then took it to the clinic to his patient. So what he did, he um, grew up bacteria in his laboratory. He killed these bacteria, obviously, and he infused back these dead bacteria into the cancer patients he operated on. And what he found, that's the news article from 1908, um, what he found that actually in some cancer patients you really can cure that way the cancer. But this was a mystery. How does this work? You infuse back dead bacteria and you have maybe, a, you have actually a really um, a powerful effect. And so um, people were suspicious. And then also at the time, radiation therapy and chemotherapy came on the market, and people got a little bit um, distracted and lost. And immunotherapy was not really um, anymore the, the really big uh, therapy approach that um, thought that would cure cancer eventually. So now we fast forward 100 years to the 1980s, because then immunotherapy or the immunology and understanding cancer and the immune system became hot again. And why? Because smart scientists discovered not that the cancer cell is too normal. Actually, cancer cells can express foreign antigens on their surface. And those um, foreign antigens can be seen by the T cell. So these foreign antigens are mutated proteins, because all you guys know um, that a cancer originates either from a virus or from a lot of mutations. And what I show you here on the, on, on the graph is, for example, on the right side, melanoma and lung cancers have a lot of, lot of mutations, thousands of mutations. And each mutation potentially could be a really strong foreign antigen presented on the surface of a cell. So now you also know people become, get melanoma and lung cancer. So just the occurrence and the presence of these foreign antigens on the surface of a cell somehow is not sufficient for the T cell to eliminate the cancer. So now how is, why is that happening? Why is the T cell um, not able to eliminate the cancer? And for that, we really have to zoom into a solid tumor. And what we find are actually the T cells within the tumor they sit on the cancer cell, and they cannot eliminate the cancer cell. So these are dysfunctional T cells. So now what's the characteristic of a dysfunctional T cell? A dysfunctional T cell expresses inhibitor receptor. They cannot proliferate. They cannot produce these important molecules that help apoptosing the, the cancer cell. And in the end, the cancer grows um, and potentially can kill the tumor-bearing host. So why is that? Because when you zoom into the solid tumors, it's not just the T cell and the cancer cell, there are other cells surrounding it. And these immune suppressive cells actively inhibit the T cell to work. And that's what we call the immune suppressive microenvironment. And in addition, there are cells, there are soluble factors, there is low nutrients levels because the cancer eats up everything, and the T cell is basically left with nothing and cannot function. So now, my lab was really interested in, or is interested to understand, well, that is okay when you look at the solid mass. But as you know, this is not, this is the end stage. And a cancer originates from a few, very few cells, from normal tissue, where there's no immune suppressive microenvironment. So now, um, what we were interested in looking at, well, it would be really cool to look at how T cells um, function, how they come in and see the tumor antigen. Um, at these very, very early stages, maybe when you have only a few cells hanging around. So if you go to the pathologist, he would say, this tissue looks totally normal. There is not a solid mass. So, and that's exactly the question we tackled. 
So how do you do this? So we generated a genetic mouse model, and in this case it was a liver cancer model, and we inject in these genetic mice a drug. And that drug turns on tumor genesis. So the liver cells become malignant, and then over time they grow and grow and grow. And what we were able to do is now to track basically from day one what the T cells do and cannot do. And so what we found was really, really surprising. What we found was that the T cells go to these very early lesions, they see the cancer, they get activated, but they cannot make any kind of cytokines that are needed to, to kill the cancer. And that happens very, very early when you only have a few cancer cells early malignant around. So there's no solid tumor, nothing. So at these very early times, they also express these inhibitory receptors that basically blunt the function of a T cell. So now, that's kind of sad, but there's hope. And over the last years, especially here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, smart scientists, dedicated scientists, um, they wor really worked on two fundamental uh, approaches to overcome this T cell dysfunction. One, they said, okay, we need to boost our immune system. And how do we do this? With checkpoint blockade antibodies. Maybe you heard of that. So now how does this work? So a dysfunctional T cell, as I told you, has this overexpression of inhibitory receptors. So what they did, they generated antibodies, anti-PD-1 or anti-CTL-4, and they infused these antibodies into the patient. And basically, it covers up these inhibitory receptors, and they cannot function, they cannot signal anymore, and suddenly you turn a dysfunctional T cell into a potent killer T cell. The second approach is, you say, I engineer in the laboratory an absolutely super killer T cell. So now how do we do it? We take out the T cells from the patients, we put them in the laboratory dish, and we put little structures called chimeric antigen receptors. They are like antibody-like um, structures, but they signal inside. And um, we generate millions of billions of those T cells in the laboratory, and then we infuse them all back into the patient. And now suddenly these super potent killer T cells can actually see the, see the antigen on the surface of a cell and potentially eliminate the cancer. So now that's great, but that therapy is not, only, is not working for everybody. Um, only a few patients are actually having really great responses, and it doesn't work for every cancer. So there is still a lot what we have to learn and do. So now, what's the next approach? What's the next step? How can we make every cancer, every cancer patient into a success story where the immune system is capable of eliminating the cancer? And for that, we have to really understand a little bit more on a molecular level how T cells are dysfunctional, why are they dysfunctional, and how it's wired molecularly. So now, all you know in the room, every single cell in your body has the same DNA sequence, right? So now, how is it, for example, that a brain cell is a brain cell, and a kidney cell is a kidney cell, and a liver cell is a liver cell? And for us two immunologists, it's incredibly important to understand what is the information that makes a T cell dysfunctional or functional. And for that, we have to learn um, um, epigenetics. So do you guys know what epigenetics is? Have you heard of it in school? Yes. Great. So we can fast forward, right? So it is basically making a cell, um, giving it an information, a phenotype, um, that is independent of DNA sequence, right? So we zoom into the DNA, and as you can see, there are regions that are open and that are closed, right? The DNA is wrapped around histones, it's coiled up, it's very knit together, and there are regions that are open. And in these open regions, you can have transcription factors coming in and activating genes. So now a brain cell obviously opens the regions that it needs to be a brain cell and closes down the regions that it needs for a liver cell. And, they, and how do they do that? Well, the cell knows where to put little chemical modification on the DNA. There is DNA methylation, for example, where a methyl group gets attached to the DNA itself, or you actually add chemical structures to the histone proteins, and then the cell knows, okay, I have to open that region and I have to close that region. So now what has this to do with T cells? We didn't know. So three years ago, nothing was known about whether this open and closed landscape is actually important for T cells. But there must be encoded this information that tells a T cell you are dysfunctional or you are functional. 
And that's exactly when I started here. We, tackled, we did a really cool technology where we said, OK, let's zoom into the epigenetic landscape of a T cell that is functional. And let's compare it to the dysfunctional T cell, what we isolate from our mouse model, OK, from these very, very early lesions. <laughs> and what we found, what you see here is, when you compare it, you look at the entire genome. There are regions that are closed that should be opened, and there are open that should be closed. So now blue is closed, red is open, OK? And when you now zoom in and ask the question, well, where are these open and closed ones? I mean, you're looking on the left side at 70,000 different regions. So how do we know what is really important? So when you zoom in, for example, for interferon gamma, which is an absolutely essential molecule for the T cell to work and eliminate cancer, what you can see is that the functional T cell has an open peak. That means it's open, accessible, and it can make interferon gamma. But the dysfunctional T cell from the tumor cannot, because there is no peak and it's closed. So we did the same. We went to the, hospi to the hospital site. We asked the surgeon to give us T cells from the cancer patient. And we asked the question, let's zoom into the epigenetic landscape of T cells from patients that undergo surgery. And we found the same. For example, CTLA-4, the inhibitory receptor on the surface, which makes the T cell dysfunctional, you have in the functional T cell regions that are totally closed, which it should be, because it should not be expressed. And in the dysfunctional T cells, it's totally open. So now, what does it tell us for the information, what we need in order to make a T cell a powerful killer T cell? And so we use now this information. We know exactly what the regions are. They should be open, and that should be closed. And now in my lab, what we are really trying to do is to epigenetically reprogram those T cells and make them really powerful killer T cells. And how do we do that? There are different approaches. We can use pharmacological drugs. There are little epigenetic drugs that can um, rewire the epigenome. And then we can do it in vitro or in vivo. And that is something ongoing. We can also use transcription factors. And we can target these transcription factors at the important region. And we can try to reverse or reprogram the T cell as well. And then the last um, technology, which is really exciting, maybe you heard about it, is the CRISPR technology, where we can actually now take this, um, for example, interferon gamma, which we know is closed. We can create um, a complex of um, large proteins, important proteins enzyme. And we can now guide with the guide RNA this large complex with enzymes to exactly the region which we identified. And we can basically take the enzyme and say, now you basically need to open that peak. And now you can transcribe, hopefully, interferon gamma. And the reverse setting is also true. We can potentially have CTLA-4, which is expressed. It's open, but it shouldn't be. We can design complexes, which we can guide with the guide RNA to exactly that region which we want to shut down. And then hopefully, um, then the CTLA-4 will be not expressed, and we make functional T cell. So that is exciting. It's ongoing. But it's clearly not where we where I mean, it's still ongoing. And we have a lot of work to do. But when you think about where immunotherapy started about almost over 100 years ago, it started at Memorial Sloan Kettering here in New York, OK? Um, on the west side, 90, um, 1990s, it was on the upper west side. Now we are on the east side. This is the research building where my lab is on the 16th floor. And um, yeah, if you are excited about it and you want to be the next generation and you want to join here at Memorial Sloan Kettering to be at part of this exciting journey, then come in the summer. And this is my lab, dedicated young scientists, hardworking, who are also trying to participate at this journey to really make and rewire the immune system that we can fight cancer. So thank you. We have time for just a couple of questions if people want to go to the mic. And I will remind everybody, for those that can stay after, all three of the speakers will be down here for individual questions. Yes. Um, which treatment is more effective, the antibody blockage immunotherapy or the killer T cell? Well, I think they are both incredibly important and powerful. For example, the CAR T cell therapy works for liquid tumor lymphoma, 
but we have still a lot to learn. How do we take these CAR T cells into solid tumors, right? And the checkpoint blockade antibodies, they work so far great for melanoma and lung, but we have to figure out, well, how do they work for pancreatic cancer, for example, or for brain cancer? And that is still ongoing. So I would say equally well for different type of cancers. Thank you. So I think what we've tried to do here today is to give you some of the excitement of what can still be learned in biology and why it's a, such an exciting discipline, both from understanding why the tumor arises and what our defense systems are for the immune system in doing this. We're at best halfway, so we need lots of help. This is a field where you yourselves just saw you stumped with your questions, several of uh, the leading investigators in their field, which means you have the curiosity to be interested. So we're pleased to have had you here tonight, and we're available by questions or if anybody wants to come up here. Otherwise, safe travels and get home safely.